In the beginning, man used sticks, stones, and animal parts for survival alone. Then, something happened along the way. What could that have been? It's time to speculate away with your hosts, Jeremy Burns and Matthew Scott Phillips. This is the dawn of music. This is Music Student 101. So I have here a blended coffee beverage. Ooh. Uh, I, I've, I've got here just coffee, just black, hot, hot. Just a regular kind of thing. Just regular, yeah. I, 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 I I've given up on trying to make coffee taste good. Mm. When you know, <laughs> I, I, I've decided that what I like is for coffee to wake me up. But I, it actually does taste. Anyway, function is the key, right? Function is the key. Uh, sadly, I, I normally I go to like local coffee, you know, place, but I just didn't have the time. The closest thing was a uh, well-known coffee chain. Oh yeah, that one. But uh, in in the past, I've actually uh, editing some of these episodes when I use I, when I get iced coffee, I would hear the ice <laughs> jingling around in the coffee cup. So today, I decided I'm going to get blended. So l- listen to this, it's smooth and silent. I'm shaking it. No one hears a thing. No, no one hears anything. Except- but I probably I probably didn't need one this tall because I, I hope hope it won't get too annoying towards the end of this episode. <laughs> if Jeremy starts talking really fast, you'll know what happened. Mm-hmm. Might have to go back and post and slow down myself a little bit. <laughs> oh, well, today is kind of a kind of a fun episode. Yeah, we're going to try to be a little chill and laid back this time because we've been going over some pretty uh, some pretty meaty stuff lately, right? I think yeah, I th- and I think we've been actually promising to be more chill and laid back a lot lately, <laughs> which maybe means we're getting a little more chill. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, we've got our we were s- sitting here sipping our coffee drinks this morning. <laughs> First of all, before we get into the episode, let's let's talk about a couple of cool things. Okay. Not long ago, we put out a call to action for our good listeners to give us a some kind of rating that helps to spread kind of spread the word. Indeed. And so I have two reviews I kind of want to share with you guys. Very nice. This is from iTunes that I found these. Uh, Monk Freak. <laughs> I love these names. <clears throat> Monk Freak seventy two says, "Great podcast. This is great!" Exclamation point. Thank you, Monk Freak. <laughs> we we do we do our best. Brief and to the point. Yeah. No BS. Speaking yep. of no BS, this, <laughs> the next one actually is this is my, I love this. I can't. Word wrath spelled W E R D wrath uh, all one word all one word says best and no BS. Yeah, Matt, do you think that we are free of BS? Ah, I thought we BS'd a lot. Yeah, I thought that was kind of like, <laughs> but maybe we don't BS as much as we think. Maybe we, we don't BS nearly as much as we think we do. <laughs> My wife listens to this true crime podcast, and these two girls—they're awesome. I can't—I don't know the names. I can't, yeah. but uh, they're really foul. They're foul. They cuss <laughs> a lot, but they're constantly digressing and going off on side things. But to me, that, that's kind of a little bit entertaining, you know. Right? Yeah. Especially yeah. when it comes to talking about these heavy theory topics. Right. Sometimes yeah. It's fun yeah. I, I see. Here, Word Wrath went on to uh, uh, elaborate uh, straight to the point. No BS side rambling. Again, I thought maybe Jeremy just edits out all our side rambling. I do maybe. edit out a good bit of it, actually. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because you know, to to make a forty minute podcast takes a couple of hours. Mm-hmm. You know, when we're doing it, when we're doing good. So exactly, you got there. There has to be some BS side rambling going on somewhere. But anyway, but they also said uh, Word Wrath also said if if you're if you're training in if you're training in music production and music theory, subscribe to this. This is a great accompaniment to your education. Keep yeah. it up. And thank you so much. It means the world to us that that uh, you guys appreciate uh, what we're trying to do here. So that alone will boost our presence a little bit in the in the search world. Uh, Word Wrath also had a little bit of uh, constructive criticism for us, which I think we should point out here. Right. That uh, he, he he or she said that um, check your tags for the show. It's hard to pull up. It's hard to pull you up by searches of a random nature, like. If you type in music theory, music theory or music student doesn't it doesn't bring you up. So yeah, we could look into fixing that. Which is strange because um, I use Libsyn as the pod, podcasting host, and right. when I'm when I'm filling out the information for each episode, it does have a tags field. They, they make us tag everything, and right? I fill that up to the brim. I think of every tag I could possibly think of. Yeah, iTunes apparently does not take tags anymore. They take the tags from the description from the show description. 
Okay. So that's my understanding of it currently. But if we have some so, social media experts out there, that so can... our show description should be the music theory, music student podcast for music people that compose music. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> I think one tag is enough for each for each thing. But apparently, we need to find a way to more artfully include the tags or more. Yeah. Efficiently. So if we have social media experts out there that know more about this or podcast Yeah, because we're pretty old and social media illiterate, We right? are. Honestly, uh, I first and foremost, we're music people. First, along with that comes music tech. Along with that comes a little bit of multimedia-based yeah, yeah. knowledge. A, a little bit, but a lot, of, a lot of my music tech knowledge and experience comes from a pre-social media world in which that was not really a thing, right? Not at all. We're having yeah. to learn from our students about that kind of stuff. Yeah, we, yeah, we have to learn from <laughs> our students sometimes about, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, we're old. I'm not even on Twitter. Me neither. I'm on it, but I, I quit it, and I still get the emails, and it's driving me crazy. Yeah, I just, and maybe somebody out there can help me with this. Uh, I, I've always sort of thought, what is the reason for me to be on this? It's just a distraction. It's another distraction. I don't need any it. It's it sounds horrible. Sorry, <laughs> just just my personal opinion. But you know, my impression of Twitter is just a bunch of just negative, horrible stuff just flying around the the internet at people like just twenty four seven. And I, I don't. I've never been given a good reason to be on Twitter. So you know, one of my good friends mentioned it was kind of like walking into a parking lot and yelling. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> except imagining, except imagining thousands, millions of people in that parking lot. Uh, <laughs> it's not just you. Sounds kind of noisy. Yeah. Um. So, anyways, if you guys have any any tips or anything you want to share with us to help us boost our presence that we haven't thought of, yes, please, please uh, get in get in touch, and and we will do what we can. Email us at info at musicstudent one hundred one dot com or look us up on Facebook. Send me a message. I'm often checking those things. Yes, Jeremy is often checking those things. <laughs> okay, you ready? Okay, you ready, man? Yes, I'm ready. Bum, 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 bum. What is it? Music that? professionals, ladies and gentlemen, this is how we approximate. <laughs> Well, we can get rights to the uh, London Symphony Orchestra version <laughs> we, of it. We can't. That that piece is Strauss. That's Strauss. What it was. That was it. Um, all Strauss. Also, Sprock Zarathustra is oh. the name of that. It's it's uh, it Zarathustra is a goddess or something. And you know what that sounds like, Matt. What side BS. <laughs> <laughs> We're that, so- that's the problem right there. We BS all the time, but you think our, but you guys think our BS is like you know really smart, intelligent stuff because you know it did sound kind of smart. Yeah, we we, <laughs> we 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 just nerd out so much that our BS sounds like actual education, which you know, which it's not. <laughs> Fake it till you make it, baby, or edit it out. If it or edit work. it out. <laughs> okay, so all that to say. Um, Yes, this will be our first history episode, and we're we're excited. This is going to be kind of loose. This is going to be really this the dawn of music. We're going to actually talk about before what yeah. we speculate might have happened. Yeah, and all, all of this is, you know, number one, not quite our field. Yep. And number two, speculation, because uh, 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 as an umbrella statement over all of this, we kind of have to say it is not... A hundred percent known everything that happened, you know, because when you're talking about uh, uh, pre pre recorded history, you know, uh, prehistoric stuff, then you know we have we have to put we have to put this pe- this puzzle together with the pieces we have, you know, and yeah. not even us really. Anthropologists are piecing together this puzzle, you know, people smarter than us, or and they can't get it from any writing. This is the predates writing or any kind of. The passing down of any kind of written, you know, uh, education or tradition. Right. So we are starting at the very beginning here. And I am talking about two million years ago. Two million years ago. Again, prehistory, pre-writing, right? Yes. Um, we What we do know based on, I guess, you know, artifacts that we have found and tools that were made, that we know that during this time, also known as the Stone Ages... Right. Uh, that uh, our ancestors were making tools using stones and sticks and what. Is that why they called it that? 
Is that why they called it the Stone the, Age? That's, is... that's my understanding, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Um, and there's the Old Stone Age and the New Stone Age. We'll start off, obviously, with the Old Stone Age, the Paleolithic Era, which you've heard before, I'm sure. I think so, yeah. This is uh, 2 million BCE, between that and about 8,000 BCE. So what is BCE? Initially, BC was before Christ. It was before Christ, right. But uh, BCE, I learned it at one point, but... Is it, I think it's before the Common Era? Before the Common Era, okay. Yep, yep. But anyways, um, so, this, uh, this, of course, this is all, you know, um, still the old Stone Ages we're talking about, the Paleolithic Era. Mm -hmm. During this time, people were mainly hunters and gatherers. Right. It was like I knew that. And during this time, our ancestors had mainly three classifications, um, pretty much in this order, though staggered throughout different locations. We had the Homo habilis, we had Homo erectus, and then Homo sapiens. Now, the first of these, Homo habilis, was known as the handyman, I guess. Habilis is the translation of handiness or ability. Man with ability. That, that was the guy making stone tools. So they called him Homo habilis because he had the ability to make these tools. Exactly. That ability coming from opposable thumbs and some level of intelligence, I would assume. And, exactly. Okay. I, I don't know if this was the guy that made fire or not. Um, I think maybe Homo erectus made fire. But again, historians, let us know. <laughs> but yeah, Homo habilis was making the tools. Um, okay. Homo erectus finally started walking upright. Right. We're yeah. not going to get into why we decided to do that. Yeah. It's time for us where so crawling is easier. Yeah. So there was no homo neatus, uh, uh, almost neatus a turkey sandwiches or. You know. <laughs> neatus to reach is that thing higher up in the tree ish. <laughs> yeah. Tree ish. Um, so this, this, uh, this home man started walking upright homo, between. Homo, I've just been stressed us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this was between 2 million and 50,000 years ago. So we're getting a little bit closer here. Um, during this period, a few things are happening now. Okay. In 60,000 BCE, between that and 30,000 BCE, people began to take an interest in art. This is when we started dating, using carbon dating and finding that some of these cave paintings and clay figures go back to as far as that, you know? So what, what, made, them, what made them want to start taking an interest in art? Do we know anything about I mean, was it just... An evolving higher intelligence, or? I think this is where we can have a little fun with our speculations, Matt, and I have a few ideas. Okay, good. Let's have some fun. So, when I'm thinking about how cave art might have started, or what reason he might have, it might have, it might not have been all for enjoyment. It might have actually been, hey, this is how you kill this animal. Oh, wow. That's, this is just my theory. Yeah, you know, okay. Kind of instruction. Or maybe it's like um, taking a picture of a moment in time. You know, this is my cave. These are my feet. This is what I've done. So it wasn't sort of self-expression so much as, yeah, and you could have like sort of been teaching other people, you know, this is what the animals we kill look like. This is what the animals that tend to kill us look mm -hmm. like. <laughs> exactly. Uh huh. That's so, interesting. So yeah. pe people are thinking around the time that they started experimenting with art, cave art, and this isn't just cave art. This is also like little clay Clay things that go beyond a utilitarian purpose. Right, yeah. yeah. So it's not just to carry, carry things. Maybe this guy made a clay picture of his grandma. Yeah. <laughs> or of a baby, a, a, like a cute baby woolly mammoth or something. I don't know. Yeah, so there's a point where we have like clay pots that are just used to carrying water from the lake so we don't have to go down to the lake all the time. And at some point, we made the clay pot look pretty. Yeah. <laughs> and why did that happen? I don't know. Maybe it started off as an as an uh, to distinguish one pot from the next, or maybe an ownership thing. This is mine. This is yours, and and then uh, <laughs> and then maybe somebody made something that just wasn't a clay pot at all. I was like, "What are you gonna do with this stupid little thing? It looks like a snowman." Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> all speculation. All complete spe So some anthropologist is going to rip us a new one. I can, I, know. I can feel it right now. <laughs> but yeah. All right. But these are just some, some things that kind of came to mind when I was reading this and thinking about why, you know, why some of these things might be, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's kind of, it's also, scientists also think that around this time that maybe they're starting to experiment with sound a little bit. Ah, experiment with sound. So what are some reasons they might do that? Well, um, you know, I think they could sort of use it as, as a way to call to each other and say, hey, I'm over here, mm -hmm. right? You know, don't don't 
don't throw your don't throw your spear at me or something. You know, I'm not a I'm not an animal that you're hunting. I'm another human. Before the invention of fluorescent orange hunting vests. Right, yeah. Uh, before they had bright orange, they had to sort your of camouflage. Like, well, yeah, yell, <laughs> hey, over here, or you know. Well, that's what I was kind of thinking too. You know, I was thinking maybe to signal each other, possibly to coordinate attacks or hunting ventures. You know, right? Yeah. M- maybe Ung is up in a tree with a spear. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And Og is on the ground, <laughs> shaking the bush. So the Og. S- Og. Yeah. And he's shaking the bush so that the saber toothed tiger is like, "Hey, what's over there?" <laughs> the saber toothed tiger starts walking over there, and Ug. This now <laughs> jumps from the tree and kills the saber tooth because it's that simple to kill a saber tooth tiger. Right, yeah, it's a bad, you know. But you know, they could be coordinating attacks on creatures uh, for hunting. They could be coordinating att- attacks on other gang, uh, gangs, other uh, other tribes. Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, maybe uh, warn against rival tribes or communicate with neighborly, more neighborly tribes. And that they would need different sounds for to to do that to to coordinate. Attacks on other tribes versus to, to coordinate hunting and, and things, yeah. And here's another thing I thought about. What if they're actually trying to, um, not unlike the duck hunter who brings out the duck call, maybe they're trying to emulate mating calls to lure yeah. other, to also lure animals in for the hunting purposes. Yeah. That, that reasons be, to experiment with sound? Yeah, reasons to experiment with sound and, and to sort of start, that would be, a, a, it seems like that would be a good reason to start needing to know and or needing to distinguish differences in sounds, right? Right. So, like, a, you know, a duck sounds like this versus, you know, some other animal sounds a different way. So it's not just sound as a general concept, you know. It's not, and it's no longer an any sound will do kind of world. So now we've got to start thinking about it. We're going from grunts to hoots to, <laughs> to maybe eventually whistles <laughs> of some kind. All speculation. Well, you know, I... I this is not my field. I've I've heard anecdotes over the years. Um, I, I've I've heard it said that some people believe that humans had music before they had speech. Mm. Yeah, you know, and this could be sort of what they were talking about. Yeah. Let's talk about rhythm actually for a little bit because Ooh, when rhythm. I think about, let's go back to the Stone Ages. Let's go back to the old Stone Ages where where people are actually sitting there making things with banging rocks together. Yeah. If you're if you're hammering something, mm-hmm. you're not like pop, pop, pop. Right. Yeah. You're doing it. Pop. Right. You're doing it in a, with a pulse. There's a pulse. There's a kunk, 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 kunk. You get into yeah, a groove. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you have to wonder if that that was a very ancient thing as well. And maybe one cave guy was like, "Hey, I see him doing that. I'm going to try and do it at the same time as him." Same do it at the same time. And they as just him. fell over laughing <laughs> because that was so darn cool and new and entertaining. Uh, or they could have thought, "Hey, this is a really great way to synchronize work." Yeah. Oh yeah, like a uh, stroke. Yeah, stroke. right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, maybe those Vikings sort of figured out at some point. It's probably before the Vikings. That's that's sure. much later, right? Sure, they had boats. Ug and Ong didn't even have boats. <laughs> <laughs> you drop them in the water, they're just going to sink. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, they could have figured out really quick. Hey, you know this this goes faster and is more synchronized because we if we all do it at the working uh, together. And two, just I don't know. Maybe this is just my cultural bias or whatever. But it, it seems so so intuitive, right? Uh, to to just. You know, because because like you said, you don't you don't hammer something arrhythmically. If you're going to do the same act a a, a, a series of times, you know, it, se- it almost seems like instinct to just do it. Uh, 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 uh. You know that? I mean, you you don't even think about doing it that way. You just do it that way. Mm-hmm. You know, and that that's the way hearts beat, right? They don't. You know, yes, it's uh, something very very connected. Life like biology. And yeah, yeah. Rhythms. So, yeah. When I knock on a door, I do the shave and a haircut, but that's just because I know I lo- I'm trying to be fun. Before that, I just knocked on the door, pop, 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 pop. Which is a rhythm. Yep. A fast one, but yeah. <laughs> so, little things like that, you know? Um, yep. Kind of curious about that. Well, let's move on uh, from the from the Paleolithic or Old Stone Ages to the ne- Neolithic or New Stone Ages. The New Stone Age. I, you know, I never knew that's what Neolithic meant. I just found out the New other night. Stone Age. That, or... I learned this all a long, long time ago, <laughs> back in the Stone Ages. Back in the Stone Ages. I've forgotten a lot of things since then. Yeah, I don't think I. Yeah, I don't think I've ever known learned some of this stuff. So, yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, 
A little, little diversion from the usual. This, uh, the, the New Stone Ages, the Neolithic era, was between 8,000 BCE and 3,500 BCE. Okay. So during this time, our ancestors are, ancestors are finally learning to settle down. Right. Uh, they're farming. Exactly. Agriculture. So... And they, why they, have to kill food when we can just grow it? Yeah, I'm not going to chase this herd of buffaloes all over the region during the season <laughs> changes and live like a buffalo. <laughs> I want to live like a man, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Homo habilis. Homo, homo sapien. I want to be a homo sapien. Homo sapien. Man capable of thought or abstract thought, maybe. Uh, and that's what we are. Yeah, like abstract or critical thought. Technically speaking, any, yeah. Hey, you know something kind of cool as another side BS note? I was actually reading a pretty interesting article on, NPR, on the NPR site today, and it was talking about how, according to this study from the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, our Neanderthal ancestors actually shared a lot more phenotypes with us than we initially thought. Uh, phenotypes being observable characteristics or traits that were maybe influenced by the environment on the species. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's very coincidental you should mention that up. I was just looking at the Neanderthals. I was researching Neanderthals recently. No kidding. Yeah. Just, just because I'm, I'm a huge education nerd and this is how I spend my time. You're going to dig this, man. Well, it's not, it's not that great, but it is interesting. <laughs> the, the genotypes that we, or the phenotypes that we share, the genetic similarities that we share with the Neanderthals yeah. are all based on how sunlight, how we react to sunlight. Really? Circadian rhythms. Yeah. Pigmentation of skin and hair. Wow. Suggesting that there might have actually been blonde and redheaded Neanderthals. Yeah, I heard that. So that's... I, I, I heard that. And yeah, because I was researching that too. I, um, and, you know, this is the most veritable and trusted source of information in our time, Wikipedia. But according to Wikipedia, uh, like the, we, we share 98 per point something percent of our genetics with Neanderthals. That's a little too much. <laughs> That's a lot, yeah. Well, the, yeah, it, it sounds like a lot, but I, I think in, in terms of genetics, it's those last 2% that can make all the difference <laughs> in the world, right? <laughs> apparently, between between knuckle jaggers and people putting men on the moon, apparently this is a little 2%. Apparently. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, that 2% can, can, can make a huge difference in the terms in, in, in genetics, is my understanding, I don't know. But but yeah, um, and they, they, they talk about like the, the red-headed Neanderthals and, and the pigment kind of things, and... Um, some people believe that, that that's where redheaded came from, but a lot of a lot of scientists also think of that as a coevolution mm. that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals eventually evolved a, a red hair pigmentation. You know that, that, that we don't get red hair from the Neanderthals having evolved that. It's not a it's not a line. It's like we both did it sort of silent because there's a there's a period there in of about five thousand years in in Europe where Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. Are, are coexisting. And science are suggesting that some of them might have found a fondness for each other. Yeah. And that there could have been some cross... Um, yeah, yeah. And and that that's a matter of some debate as well. Not everybody thinks that happened. But there are, there are some scientists that do think that happened. I think... I, I, I know people who are proof that that might have actually happened. Uh, yeah, I, I was just about to say, you know, I mean, Homo sapiens being capable of thought is, is a... <laughs> This is an assertion I feel like debating sometimes nice, myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're being a little too nice to ourselves here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But all that, all that aside, yeah. So, that, yeah, it's fascinating stuff. So people found that they can settle down in places, fertile places like near the rivers, such as the Tigris and Euphrates up right. in Mesopotamia. Yeah. One of the first known human settlements. Um, yeah. Civilizations, yeah. I guess you would say. Right. Yeah. Um, they figured, well, do we have water here? We have fertile land. We can grow stuff. Hey, yeah. you put that seed there. What happened? They learn how to grow things. They, yeah, Long they learned how to grow things. Um, now this is happening all over the world. You know, um, now that man has settled, they can kind of develop. They can start developing communities. Right. Uh, possibly some some notion, or maybe some form or notion of entertainment. Maybe ways to entertain each other. You know. Yeah. And again, all pure speculation. But you know, I kind of think well, because hunting takes hunting your food takes an enormous amount of time. Right. I mean. Yeah. There's no time to. Dance a jig. Yeah, I mean, if you're dancing a jig now, it means you're going to be starving. <laughs> you're going to be starving tomorrow, right? Because you didn't go kill anything. That'll be the last jig you ever. <laughs> It'll be the last jig you ever dance. Uh, but yeah, if you become sort of agricultural, you know, once once the seeds are planting, they're growing, they're growing. You probably have more time on your hands. I don't know. Yeah. 
feels like you would have more time on your hands. I would think so, because yeah. otherwise you're sitting there watching corn grow. <laughs> that takes a lot of time. You can write a lot of really good songs watching corn grow. Yeah. <laughs> The corn isn't going to run away, is what I'm saying, right? <laughs> yes, <just> sir. <laughs> kind of boring, boring times, man. I used to chase all these saber tooths. Now, I'm... now I'm just sitting here watching corn grow. Yeah, I but... did read once that the uh, uh, the that uh, hunting, the the becoming uh, omnivorous, meaning hunting meat, was was uh, essential to the evolution of human intelligence. Hmm. Because because. Um, Strategy involved in right, yeah, right. Strategy involved, and uh, you had to you had to coordinate. And we really weren't equipped to be predators, right? We didn't have claws or fangs. We didn't run particularly fast. Uh huh. You know, so uh, we had to get creative if we were actually going to to hunt meat. So becoming omnivorous was a was, and the and hunting was was uh, very necessary to develop to evolve intelligence. <laughs> That's interesting, but I'm going to throw something back uh, about whoever came up with that theory. I'm going to throw a little something back at them as the devil's advocate for ve- or as the vegetarian's advocate <laughs> because the farmers had to start to really pay attention to seasons and cycles. Ah. And I think that involves a certain level of abstract or... or of abstract thought. Yeah. 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 Seasons and cycles and, you know, what... It- I am a 40-year-old college graduate in the year 2017, <laughs> and I have this... Bed, raised bed of dirt out in my backyard, and I'm trying to grow some corn, and I cannot for the life of me grow. Doing. So yeah, I don't know. The Anderthals, apparently, that's somewhere where those two genes made a difference with the, with me and the uh, Homo sapiens. Yeah. Think it's easy to grow corn, boy. <laughs> you can't grow stink on a monkey. <laughs> Another fine Simpsons quote. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a. Uh... If there were any farmers out there who had not been offended by this conversation so far, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> now they definitely. <laughs> well, um, we're from Alabama. We, we are can, from we, Alabama. We can talk like that. We are totally, <laughs> yeah. Um, Those accents are not feigned. <laughs> no, no. Especially if I say nine, like the word nine, nine. <laughs> yeah. eight, nine, ten, ten. <laughs> Yeah, you know what I like about this podcast, Jeremy, is what? that there is no BS side rambling. Mm. <laughs> That's one of my favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> Word Wrath is going to abandon us now. He's going to take down the down the radio. I retract my my positive review. <laughs> Full of BS, but still great podcast, maybe. Full great, of BS, still great maybe. podcast, maybe. Hopefully. Um. Okay. Let's get let's get back to the kid. Okay. To the, all right. All right. <laughs> we 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 at this point we've kind of gotten up to the the civilization, the forming of civilization. So right. And and with that comes you know written written history, and yeah. we'll, we'll take it from that point. But we're kind of doing this episode to get you a little bit excited about the up and coming history episodes. Yeah. But first, I'm gonna I would like to talk about um, this really cool finding. This is not new news, actually, but to you, some of you, and to me, certainly, it may be, mm-hmm. or it was when I was checking it out. And I got this from an article in the National Geographic News back in June 24th, 2009, by James Owen. Back in 2008, in South Germany, in the Ach Valley. Uh, there was a cave system. Mm-hmm. I'm going to try not to butcher this because my German is not much greater than my Italian. <laughs> um, the Holofels Caves. All right. The um, In this cave system, they found an almost complete flute made from a bone. Wow. This was the radius or the forearm equivalent of the, uh, of the griffin vulture. Okay. Now, the griffin vulture was a very huge bird. Uh, I wonder pat- if that's what's inspired the, the, the mythological creature griffin. They kind of thought, I mean, it was so huge, they may have thought it looked like the size of a lion or something. Well, I'm talking 8.7 foot wingspan. Practically that's a ni- huge. Practically a 9 foot wingspan. Yeah. Yeah, that thing will, that thing will put a shadow on you <laughs> flying overhead. Um, but I'm kind of wondering, was this bird particularly easy to catch? If you think about it, vultures, what do they do? They gather the scavengers. Up, they yeah. free, they're in this feeding frenzy around this dead animal. Any cave guy could easily kind of maybe quietly walk up yeah. or throw a rock or whatever and, and take down this creature. Yeah, especially a homo sapien that has the intelligence and, you know, the ability to go, you know, hey, that thing's just sitting there, you know, whack. S- strategize with Og. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure what kind of eating, how, what good eating they were, but maybe they were good music. Well, you know, to get to the bone, they had to... Get the meat off it somehow. I'm sure they ate it. Mm-hmm. You could, yeah, use it. And rather than just throwing the bone away, they decided to make a flute out of it. 
Um, again, all speculation, but oh. I think that that might be how they were able to use the vulture radius right. instead of a saber tooth. Right, femur. right, yeah. <laughs> um, because we know all about these ancient animals, right? Right, yeah. We're clearly experts in this. The uh, but the flute itself was actually uh, it's twelve pieces all found within a space within about a square foot. So this this hadn't been this area has not been messed with at all at all. Okay, yeah, at over all. over time. Um, it was 22 centimeters in length, 8 millimeters in diameter, which is very, very small if you think about it. Yeah. It's a very thin little whistle. Yeah. Um, it had five holes. Mm. I'm going to make an astronomical speculation here and wonder to myself if that has anything to do with some primitive form of the pentatonic scale. Hmm. That's astronomical speculation. That's a pretty astronomical leap. Yeah. It's not impossible. Uh, you know, the, the pentatonic scale seems to be one of those basic. It does, you know, that, and that's what I was just sitting here thinking about. Is it, it? It seems to be. It seems to be common throughout the world and throughout history. The pentatonic scale. There is something special about it, mm -hmm. or some way primitive version of it. Of, yeah. of it you know. But uh, another thing they found that there was two V-shaped notches carved into the part of the instrument that would appear to be the mouthpiece. Nice. So these people are are hey they've been running some experiments to, with sound. They, right, they've yeah. done things to 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 find so, some desired effect. Right, yeah. Uh, be it a mating call type thing to lure yeah, animals yeah. in, or be it to actually entertain each other and make strange sounds that the human voice doesn't normally make, and therefore it kind of blows their minds. Yeah, the second one is the one I want to be true. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Which doesn't make it true, obviously. No, but, no. But it is definitely the one I want to be true. But it does suggest a certain magic about music that I think we both believe in. Right. Right? Yeah. Um, now, in these same excavations, uh, not far from this area, they also found what appear to be two ivory flutes. Ivory, huh? Yeah, and you know where ivory comes from? Uh, elephants? Or at the time... Woolly mammoths. The woolly mammoth. Okay, Have you yeah. ever seen a woolly mammoth tusk? It's huge. It's huge, and it's curvy as hell. Yeah. So, this was a very complicated process, and I think required a good bit more abstract thought, because... It involved um, carving a cylindrical shape out of a naturally curved tusk, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have to split it, carve out the center, which would be the hole the, where the wind blows through, mm -hmm. and then somehow reseal it. I can't imagine how they would be resealing this other than yeah. with sticky little animal guts or some kind of resin, pine resin Girl, or something. I have no idea. <laughs> you know what strikes me, a question that strikes me, and there may not be a good answer to this, but I'm, I'm sure there's an answer that I want to be true. Why would they carve these flutes out of ivory if it's so hard? When we know they could just carve them out of vulture bone, mm -hmm. right? Um, if we're just using them to call to each other or something, you know, why? You know, if it's if it's so much harder to do it, you know, why why would they take the extra effort to to make make the also make flutes out of ivory? I can only speculate that they're thinking longevity. It's like I don't want to have to tackle that. I don't want to have to do this again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That 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 would that's plausible, I suppose. Yeah. I noticed this ivory lasts a lot longer than this little pile of vulture bones. Yeah. the 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 explanation I want to be true is that the ivory sounded better. That's what I want to hear too. Yeah. That's what I is, that, too. is that there was some quality to the this to the ivory flutes that they liked better. Like a and it's like, yeah, so this is more work, but but it's going to produce sounds that we enjoy more. Yeah, you like know? craftsmanship, taking pride in your work kind of thing. Yeah. That's yeah. what I want to believe. Or, or just sort of timbrely. It's like, this sounds nicer, smoother, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what I want to believe. Mm hmm It's more sturdy. It's more durable. It'll it'll survive the, the trip from here to wherever, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all good speculations, in my opinion. So dig this. So dating methods again had determined these these finds that we're talking about these uh these bone whistles and these uh these little ivory flutes to have been thirty five thousand years old. Right. So this is in fact during the Paleolithic era. So then that's the old Stone Age. Yes. Okay. Yes. So let's back up here. Maybe this wasn't strictly sur for survival. Maybe well. this occurred before the dawn of ag. I mean, this occurred before the dawn of agri agriculture. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And finally, civilization. Right. So maybe that suggests that music for entertainment was actually a much older thing than we than we than we know. Yeah. Or than we think. It could be. It could be. Like I said, some people uh, I I have heard it said that that 
it is believed in some areas that, that humans had music before they had speech. Mm-hmm. You know? Scientists are speculating uh, during this time if music was used for a purpose, it was certainly instrumental, <laughs> if I may. <laughs> And, <laughs> and improving social cohesion and communication, which then led to the expansion of the modern human uh, relative to our Neanderthal Compared population. to our poor Neanderthal second cousins over there who were a little slow and didn't really... With those two gene differences. Yeah, and who, who didn't, really, uh, di- didn't really develop art or music or that sort of aesthetic sense. You know, they were, they were strictly utilitarian, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huh. So that's kind of a that's kind of a fun little thing to to yeah. mull on, I think. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. And now the speculation has become more fact because we're moving into an era. Yeah, we're gonna kind of tease. We're gonna have episodes on this kind of stuff, but for right now, we're gonna give you a little preview. We're gonna kind of tease, yeah, of what to look for. Um, Basically. so we told you that story to tell you this story. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so. Before the um, the Middle Ages, you were mentioning that um, the Greek and, and yeah, Roman. what we call ancient music, ancient music. Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about that. The oldest, the oldest piece of notated music that we know of was found in a tomb in Greece, hmm. and it is called the Epitaph of Sekelos. And I think it, uh, if um, my history serves me correctly, this was written for Sekulos, not by Sekulos. But it, it, it is actually written, and there are words, and there is a type of music notation which we can now interpret. And, you, you know, and people do. You can, you can hear recordings of this, uh, of this made. Hmm. You know, um, it, is, it is very pentatonic. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, it is very, uh, uh, it, it, it is very, uh, it, it generally it is agreed upon that in Greek music, uh, there was an, a stringed, in, a plucked stringed instrument often and a, a lyre, mm-hmm. you know, um, generally people sang and played the same note. So monophonic, okay, you know, meaning one melody, but that melody shared between an instrument and and, and a singer was typically in um, unison together, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I uh, I read somewhere once that uh, there's some writings of I think Plato who is actually complaining about these new musicians who will actually sing one note and play another and how ridiculous that is. Oh wow! Yeah, devils. Yeah, Double yeah, doubles. right. Uh, um, and it's kind of this, you know, kids today kind of rant by. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> they don't know how good they had it back then. Kids right. today, jeez. Yeah, but um, you know, theoretically speaking, uh, this is a Pythagorean tuning system. Okay. Uh, which means what happens is we take the the monochord, the Pythagorean chord, you know, and that's that plays a note. Uh, if you play the harmonic that is exactly halfway on that string, and guitar players will know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the twelfth fret. Mm-hmm. You know, ha- exactly half the length of that string. A node, otherwise known as a node, otherwise you know, uh, you get that note that is that exists in in a two to one ratio frequency wise. Uh-huh. You know, but it's actually also exists in a two to one ratio length wise, right? Yeah. And so the the rest of the notes are are derived by by proportions of that by Divisions. Division, yeah, dividing in half and dividing in half and dividing in half until you get uh, a range of notes. Uh, and it is not exactly the 12-note system we have today because you know, centuries and centuries later, equal temperament would come along. You know, because what, what that meant was, what, what Pythagorean tuning meant was, was that not all things were, were created e- equal. It was mathematical proportions, you know, not, not equivalent proportions. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, the distance between... You know, let's say D and E was not necessarily the distance between G and A because mm-hmm. it was a mathematical proportion. Hey, you got a major second up down here and you got a major second up here. Yeah. But they will be two different. But but they could, yeah, they could be because the notes were derived from this proportional division of a string, right? And this is what equal temperament fixed. Centuries, centuries later, we came in and said, let's just cut all this and make, and make all of these equivalent and then look at all the, you know, look at all the great stuff we can do. Mm. Um, but, uh, we know it was a Pythagorean tuning 
uh, and we know a little bit about sort of the, the, the texture, the monophonic texture and things. Beyond that, we don't know a whole lot compared to later eras about what Greek music was like. Um, same thing for Roman music, ancient music. You know, uh, we're still we're still piecing together from writings that we have, from notational methods that we're still interpreting, mm. you know, and things. We're, we're sort of piecing it together uh, bit by bit. You know, when when you get past the ancient era into the uh, medieval era, the Middle Ages. Yeah. This is when we start really being fairly certain about what was going on. And there are still questions to be answered about the Middle Ages, certainly. Mm -hmm. But the Middle Ages, these guys themselves spend a lot of time uh, looking back at ancient civilizations. You know, our civilization tends to look forward, right? Okay. The next best thing is coming, right? We, yeah. look, we look to the future. You know, we can't wait for that new iPhone. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. We're forward. They were very backwards looking. Like, the best civilizations were the ones that used to exist. Oh, yeah, so uh, the Middle Ages took uh, uh, were themselves trying to recreate what had happened in, in, in the Greek and Roman cultures. Their music was very monophonic. You know, uh, their, the, the most educated people of the Middle Ages, w at least in Europe, were the, uh, were, were the uh, religious people, the, the nuns, monks, priests. These were the educated people. And these were the people who wrote down notation systems, right? Right. These were the original kind of people who were carrying the tradition of music and making it to where it could right. be re repeated and replicated. Yeah, yeah. Um, people who are not monks and priests and what have you were almost certainly making music too. We just don't know a lot about what their music was like because, you know, they didn't write it down mm -hmm. until until later, Right, until later in the Middle Ages, for you know, and the Middle Ages spans a huge amount of time, right? It, from you know somewhere around 200 CE ish when the Roman Empire falls, all the way to the Renaissance, which is uh, 1300 CE, you know, the very beginnings of it. So this is this is a huge amount of time. We're talking a millennium, like a, a thousand years. Here. Yeah, yeah, easily. So. Um, we, we just we're just kind of we're teasing the Middle Ages here. Yeah, we're teasing. Bit. We're going to go back and explore all of this. Yeah, this, there's actually going to be a podcast on the Middle Ages, and we're going to try like hell to actually put some music. put some actual music in it. Uh, there, there is, um, but yeah, yeah, you know, and there's this, uh, there's a sort of conventional wisdom that nothing really changed for those thousand years. That's why it used to be called the Dark Ages, and nobody calls it that anymore. Right. Um, because the truth is, things were changing and things were evolving just slowly. Uh, but the, the music of this time was very religious. It was very lyrical. We're talking about the human voice, you know, um, uh, almost exclusively. Yeah. Almost exclusively. It was monophonic, a single melody. You know, um, as the Middle Ages start progressing towards the, 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 uh, the Renaissance, uh, secular music became a thing, you know, with the troubadours and trouvères and, and minor, minor zingers and... Uh, those guys, uh, as you approach... The traveling minstrels, so to speak. Yeah, right, right, yeah, the traveling minstrels and the, the court bards and things like that. Uh, as as you approach the Renaissance, polyphony starts gradually becoming a thing with the organum school in Notre Dame and, you know, the cathedral, not the football team. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and so forth, you know, these things start evolving gradually. By the Renaissance, you have polyphony, which is... Different melodies going on at the same time. Different people singing different melodies at the same time. Har harmonies, in, in fact. Well, right uh, or kind of the beginnings thereof. Okay, harmony will eventually evolve out of polyphony. I guess harmony kind of implies a certain parallel motion. It implies a parallel motion. And it implies sort of a. It implies sort of a chord structure. Okay. Uh, these guys are just they're just all singing at the same time, and they happen to be singing something different. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Um. You have in the Renaissance uh, the early beginnings of instrumental music. Technology is advancing to the point where instruments can be tuned depend uh, reliably, and that's important. Mm -hmm. So you start seeing like one of those melodies will be played on something. Yeah. Really, you see that in the in the Middle Ages too. But uh, in in the Renaissance, uh, instrumental music is starting to sort of become become a thing. Yeah. Um, you you see music that is. Uh, religious, but you also see a lot of music that is secular, and the same uh, the same composers composing both. 
you know, in 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 the same styles kind hmm. of things. Um, Wait a minute. If a church composer writes something secular, is that not a big deal back then, or is that like? It depends on it depends on the composer. Yeah, you know, uh, the Renaissance composer uh, Palestrina, who was very much in bed with Rome and in, in, in the church, uh-huh. uh, had to later apologize to uh, to the church. Oh, did he? Yeah, uh, you know, people in France and Belgium, it was less of a concern. Uh, the Re- the Renaissance was considered a humanistic period, mm-hmm. so the church was sort of losing that that stranglehold on human thinking that it had, had in the Middle Ages. Ah, yeah. Anyway, so it, it was less of a big deal. Uh, in in the Renaissance, to what else can I say? You know, we have you know we have the first sort of really emotional and expressive kind of personal music. You know, we have John Dowland and people like that who are kind of you know emo about everything. <laughs> the original, you know. emo. yeah, the original Kurt Cobain of the uh-huh. Renaissance. You know, <laughs> um, after the Renaissance. As as uh, the uh, the ideas and laws of polyphony, and there's some pretty strict laws that govern these things. You know, they're the laws of counterpoint, and there's some pretty strict rules about how you can have a whole bunch of melodies at once and have it still make sense. As those laws become even more refined, they do sort of lead to harmony. Yeah. Um, before they do that, the last great polyphonic era is the Baroque era. Okay. And this is where we start. Uh, Thinking about or start hearing about composers we may have heard before: Bach, Handel, Haydn. That's know, the first uh, time we start recognizing some of these names, right? Because yeah, what what is considered the standard repertoire? Yeah, classical uh, or even though it's Baroque era, I, I, yeah, it's considered classical music, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Considered. Uh, yeah. So this is this is what is uh, uh, most commonly known kind of stuff. Um, equal temperament happens during this period. You know, which means that, you know, no more Pythagorean tuning. Now we can play in any key that we want. And Bach shows that off. He writes a set of preludes in all, in all 12 major and 12 minor keys, a set of 24 preludes. The well-tempered clavier? Is that something? Wait, no, that's a... Yeah. Is that what that was? Yeah. Yeah. We talked about that a little bit, didn't we? Yes, we did. Yes, we, yes, we did. Cool. Yeah. He, he then, uh, well, actually, his preludes was just book of preludes. Okay. Yeah, but the well-tempered clavier did that. Did that too. You know? Okay. Um, or at least uh, ran the gamut of the yeah. Piece. Well, it, it, it at least was was again showing off. Look at look at what we can do now. You know, kind of things. Uh, but he made one book of preludes and then made another book of preludes. Or he did the same thing again. Uh, instrumental music is now uh, is now an equal of vocal music for the first time in history. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have in the Baroque era, we have, um, and we're going to go back and talk about all of this in greater detail at some point, right? Yeah. But in the Baroque era, we have uh, uh, harmony as being a thing. We have forms like a uh, ritornello form, where you keep coming back to the same sort of musical passage over and over again as a way of structuring the, you know, which will lead to rondo form in the classical era and, and other things that are. are uh, well known like that, the laws of counterpoint are extremely sophisticated. The polyphony of Bach is it reaches its zenith. Yeah, it's yeah pretty well well structured stuff. I mean, yeah, he's yeah. put a lot of work into this. Right. Yeah, and then moving into the classical era, this is the era that is Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven. Okay, those are the heavy hitters. Yeah, yeah, and this is and this is homophonic music, meaning this is harmony. This is this is definitely chords, mm-hmm. right? Very clear phrases, very clear structures, you know, um, very balanced sort of music. Hmm. Yeah, you know, and Beethoven in particular uses this uh, very aristocratic, balanced kind of music to create something that is very emotional and very personal. Taking Beethoven as their inspiration. In uh, the composers of the Romantic era, uh, it, it greatly expand these highly balanced forms and structures and phrases. Um, they create uh, extremely emotional music that is more dissonant and more uh, more un- unbound by strict procedures. You know, and they create music that is ref- you know program music comes from the Romantic era, music that represents you know um, 
galloping through a forest or, oh. or, or having a dream where you go to hell, you know, and, and yeah. things like this. Uh, this is the this is the 18th century now. Starting to use music to convey um, actions and ideas and, and like physical yeah. things. Yeah, and actually it's more the 19th century, sorry. It's the 1800s, it's the 19th century. Uh, that yep. always messes me up. That always messes me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the 19th century, you know. Moving into the twentieth century. Oh, but before we move on, should we mention some of the heavy hitters? I'm thinking lists. Oh, Chopin, sure, yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah. The there, there's actually a lot of heavy hitters in the, in the Romantic era. Uh-huh. Schumann, Schubert, Liszt, Brahms, Berlioz. Ah. Uh, uh, oh shoot, who else? Mendelssohn. But you know, mm. a lot of these are still very European composers. Am I correct? Have oh we, yeah, have yeah, we yeah, moved yeah, over yeah. to like I know that eventually we get into Rachmaninoff and Stravinsky. Yeah, who are also European, but they come to America. They sorry, come to America, yeah. Right, right. I apologize. I meant more like Eastern European. Yeah, like Turkey and yeah, we get in, yeah, we get into uh, Romania. Tor- well, towards the end of the Romantic era, uh, nationalism and exoticism are both very prevalent. You know, uh. Uh, strong cultural identity with music is a, is a big deal, and 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 yeah, we start getting uh, composers like uh, Dvorak and Smetana. Mm, love and, Smetana. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, uh, people like that. Dvorak actually comes to America for a while, you know. Moving moving into the twentieth century, those all those rules that had been holding us together for so long, the rules of counterpoint that had become the rules of harmony, they start to break down. Mm. And we start really deconstructing everything, slowly at first and then picking up speed. Composers like Stravinsky question some very basic fundamental Assumptions about what music ought to do, both aesthetically and uh, constructively, you know, and, and, and in the way that music is constructed. You feel like he had a need to to kind of is this kind of like a um, what is it called when people is like a rebellion of sorts? Is it a rebellion of sorts? I think so. And we can talk about this more when we actually do a podcast on the twentieth century. Absolutely. But I. Th- I I feel like they had reached the point where it was very difficult for them to come up with new things to do. Uh-huh. You know, the the romantic era had sort of stretched these ideas to its to their limits in some idea in some in some ways, in many significant ways. Mm-hmm. So the composers of the early 20th century were faced with you know either going backwards you know, or just sounding the same as ni- as romantic era composers and just this is what music sounds like now forever mm-hmm. or sort of Starting to break some rules in, in 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 the name of advancing and doing new stuff, and doing stuff people hadn't heard before, mm-hmm. and it, it, they they break a lot of rules, you know. Uh, starting with Stravinsky, but moving into Schoenberg, and then eventually, you know, Pierre Boulez, and then you know people moving into people who are still alive today, you know, like Philip Glass and, oh, and, and John Adams, and hey. You know, I saw Koyana Squatsi the the other day on TV. Did you really? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Pluto, it's like an app that you can get. It's like a yeah. live streaming kind of app. And sure enough, Koyana Squatsi was on it, if I pronounced that right. <laughs> Philip Glass, man, it was really something else. Yeah, yeah. If you guys check it out, it's a very long Indian name. <laughs> but if yeah. you Google with a K, Koyana Squatsi. Right, yeah. Definitely check out Philip Glass in general. Mm-hmm. You know. Minimalist composer. Mi- yeah. Very right. a lot of arpeggiations kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, so long story short, the 20th century was very deconstructivist and very experimental. Mm-hmm. You know, people were just sort of experimenting with, well, what will it sound like if I do this? Both in terms of music theory and in terms of new um, media. Of course, technology brings the idea, brings the... Technology brings the possibility of music that incorporates electronics, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, so electronic music becomes a thing. It, it, it brings the possibility of new instruments. Yeah, you know, um, it, it brings with it the rethinking of old instruments. You know, extended techniques become a thing. I, I can't wait to talk about Henry Parch. Yeah. Oh Speaking man, of isn't which, he fascinating? This guy made up all of his own crazy. Created his own instruments and things, instruments. and he was a hobo for a while. <laughs> was he? And, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, yeah. He rode the trains for <laughs> for for a big part of his life. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating guy. The 20th century is definitely going to be one of the more um, I think, interesting, interesting yeah. eras. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a lot to talk about. We do. Yeah. So we covered the kind of the pre the pre civilization. We kind of covered. 
the ancient music of Greek and Ro- you know Greece and Rome. Right. Yeah. And then we moved in. We kind of gave you guys a little tease of the coming episodes, which will be starting with Middle Ages music. Yes, hopefully. Then going into the Renaissance. Going into the Renaissance. Then moving on to Baroque. To the Baroque. Right on to classical. Into the classical era. Romantic. The Romantic era. And then finally. And then finally the 20th century. 20th century. And then maybe finally, finally uh, contemporary music. The 21st century. What is going on now? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which, uh, ironically enough, is going to be easier to talk about. <laughs> yeah, theory-wise. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, I'm kind of glad that we, we spent a good year... In this, in this little dungeon here recording theory right. and ear training, because I think that is going to help make the history episodes make a bit more sense. I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, we've been, we've been wanting to talk about uh, the history of music for a while. Uh, there are some challenges, copyright-related challenges. Yes. Um, pedagogy-related challenges. You know, what, you know, how do we talk about this exactly, you know? Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think the theory will help the history make more sense, and hopefully the 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 reverse will also be true. Hopefully, the history will help the theory make a little more sense as to how the, some of this stuff came about. You know, it's not just it's not just random stuff someone made up. You know, and along with these, uh, something we didn't quite mention, along with these history episodes that we're going to be coming out with at some point, we're going to be including this beautiful long word. Ethnomusicology. Ethnomusicology, right. So all the stuff we've been talking about, even some of the prehistorical stuff we talked about today, this is all mainly Europe, Uh right? Which is one teeny, tiny, small part of the globe. Yes, sir. And ethnomusicology is the study of the history and uh, cultural practices vis-a-vis music of all of the cultures of the world. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. um, Every culture almost has a... Musical tradition that is is uh, is old and rich and complex as Europeans, yeah. yeah. And so we, you know, we would like to get into some of those at some point too, and even think, if it's only as superficially as we pour. Uh, well, it might know. be, but it might be a little more in depth because we have a colleague of ours that we went to school with at UAB, Neil Mathern. Yes, correct? we do. And Neil Mathern is, in fact, a is ethnomusicologist. An ethnomusicologist. And I think. I would greatly look forward to, A, just hearing that guy's voice again, but B, right, hearing yeah. what he has to say about some of these things. But I think this would be a more advanced, once we get into the more advanced phases of this podcast, it might be yeah. a little while down the road before we tackle the uh, the, just this, the ragas of India or the right. the microtonal scales of you know Asia. And, right, you know. right, yeah. So, um, but here's the thing, guys. Back to the challenge we were talking about earlier. I have a call to action. Call to action. Call to action. Call to action. I don't know. We got to have a, a, a theme. Professional for all. musicians. Again, ladies and gentlemen. We're, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is what we do for a living. Nothing that sounded like what I just did. <laughs> but we are, the, one of the challenges is to um, find versions of some of, these, some of these old Gregorian chants, for example, that haven't been copyrighted. We're going to have to start making our own. So I'm going to be talking to people around here that I know who maybe church people or people in academia who are historians who know the way these things sound and can actually give us examples that we can actually therefore in turn play on our podcast to give you guys a better idea of what some of these things sound like. This has been one of the big holdups for the history episodes yeah. because we want to make them as engaging and as beautiful and cool as possible. And that's just going to, that cannot be done without having some music in it. In Absolutely. So there you go. So if we have people out there who might be a part of a church choir or choir directors, Renaissance Fair people, whatever, man, we would love to hear your music. Send it in to us or give us, you know, write us at info at musicstudent101.com. We can tell you a little bit more about, what we're, you know, what we're looking for. God, that coffee really is kicking and I'm, and I'm stumbling <laughs> and I'm interrupting myself here. But I am excited about this, actually. I, I really think that if, if we get some responses from some of these people, maybe you can be featured and heard all around the world. Yeah, there you this go. Podcast. So let us know. Let us know. We'll be looking for that. And we're going to start with the Middle Ages, which is going to include a lot of Gregorian chant, monof- you know, monophony. Right. Um, then we have a few things that we're definitely looking for. So Yeah, absolutely. Maybe so. you can help us help you. <laughs> right? Yeah, so let us know. Yep, contact us. And um, we guys, we, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Yes, uh, and, and, and the ones to come. We'll probably be back to theory next time. Yep, there might be a little bit more of that, but uh, it was a fun little aside, was it not? Uh, I hope it was. 
Thanks for your reviews. And keep them coming. If you wish to donate to our cause, click the donate button on the homepage of our website, musicstudent101.com.